I do feel as Jude does, it's, it's wonderful to have youth and new ideas in the industry and I learn a lot every day. Um, Council Groves is a 72 unit low income housing community. We have one, two, three, and four bedroom units. Um, we were built in 1972. Um, so we've been, my understanding is we were one of the first low income communities in um, Missoula. Um, we were light. Um, and a number of the different parishes got together throughout the community and started the organization. Um, it was, the project was sponsored by Catholic Social Services in Helena, and so today our board is only made up of um, members from each of the Catholic Social Services, Knights of Columbus, um, uh, and we are always interested in new members. We used to have a member from the Senior Citizen and some of the other different characters of, um, uh, and, uh, throughout the community. Uh, let's see. It's, I've been managing Council Groves 12 years now. It was a very difficult property when I took it over. We, through the support of a Tamarack property management company out of Billings, and the board of directors have been able to renovate all 72 of our units and we're now starting over again um, we have uh, been able to work on our 504 transition plan and accessibility ada we have um, close to four units two are fully accessible and another two are hearing and visually impaired so that's been very exciting for us. It was one of the only properties Tamarack had to go through a full 504 fair housing audit. And we received a letter from Fair Housing Denver basically telling us that we were doing a good job to keep it up. I think it's the experience I've had within our community um, and working with a lot of agencies around this table in terms of looking at accessibility and um, what works and what doesn't work. If you've had an opportunity to visit any of those accessible units, they're very nice. Um, we have a community room in which houses our um, after-school boys and girls club program. We've been working with that organization for about nine years to provide after-school programming. We also, six years ago, opened a neighborhood network computer learning center. Um, for a number of years, we used a Montana Technology Corps member, a AmeriCorps member to staff. We're kind of in limbo now because some of the funding for some of those different programs have gone away. But our board is a very altruistic board, and they really not only want to provide affordable, low-income housing, but also support services that um, um, allow and work with our residents. We are facing our paying off our mortgage in the next four years. We are potentially stepping back, trying to figure out what we're going to do. Um, we have a beautiful land site. If you have never been there, the property sits on about seven acres, and we have a large basketball court, playground area. It's a beautiful setting off South Third. Um, so in the process of looking at the, at the paying off the mortgage, we may look at restructuring and entering into another mortgage. We do have an aging facility, boilers that are only at 60%. Um, we have some uh, code issues that were to code in the 70s that if we try to do major renovations on some of our buildings, um, we have to take care of those code issues at this point. Uh, so, and air conditioning in Missoula was never allowed. And so we really feel that with the changing in the future, our units, especially our third floors, when they get to 100 degrees in the summer, our units won't handle, the electrical load will not handle air conditioners in every unit. So there's a lot of things. I have a wish, wish list, and the board is never um, concerned that I won't have something to spend money on. <laughs> we just put new roofs on our building and did fascia and soffit siding, since we were doing the roofs, to a tune of about $125,000. And so that dipped into what's called our reserve for replacement, 
which we deposit about $10,000 a month to, and we're required to have 24 months of that. And so we're kind of, you know, they let us drop a little bit below that 24 month mark, but we do see that we are continuing to upgrade our property. Um, we work a lot with the organizations and agencies around this table. I can't think of the support that you give our residents. We find that people will house with us for anywhere from two to three years, and then they become eligible for a Missoula Housing Authority voucher. And so we tend to see that trend, and we've seen that trend. Um, some people have chosen to stay, which is great. We have an opportunity um, at times where some of our renters become market renters and they choose to stay on our property because we take care of the property. We, um, you know, they don't have to mow the yard or show the sidewalks. And where can you find a four bedroom in Missoula for a thousand dollars with all utilities paid? Um, I will say this though, we are. The biggest challenge we have today is housing and um, keeping our four bedrooms filled because family sizes are smaller today than they were in the 70s. We have 12 four bedroom units. Uh, I appreciate, we send out the affirmative fair housing marketing letter twice a year to about 60 organizations here in Missoula. If you're not getting one, please let me know I, and I'll make sure you get on our list. Just to inform you, you know, we take applications for our waiting list. It takes approximately four to six weeks to process. And then we house by date of application on our waiting list. Our waiting lists are fairly thin right now. Um, the one bedrooms don't turn over very often, but um, when they do, they seem to be hard to fill because most people who have waited on a list two years um, tend to have found other more stable housing. So one of the most exciting things since I've been there is our activity in the drug-free poster contest. Um, Human Resource Council, when I first started, we had no money to do a party or anything for the kids, so um, a few years in a row they gave us grants to be able to um, put on an activity for the kids and to get people excited. Over the last nine years, we've had eight national winners and continue to um, have a number of regional winners in that contest, so it's pretty exciting for us. So I want to thank everyone here. You know, um, I hear the um, school board and other people talking about how, it, how wonderful it is to live in Missoula and how supportive the community is. And I really have found that with managing this nonprofit community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Andrea Davis. I'm the executive director of Homeward, and um, some of you I know, and some of you I don't know. Um, I to give a little bit of background to myself, uh, just so you know, um, I used to work for Homeward from 2001 to 2003 as their asset manager, basically um, managing the existing properties and doing all the compliance work that we're required to do, both for federal and uh, state grants as well as private foundation grants. Um, and then I've actually worked for the Housing Authority with that benefiting to my Housing Authority folks here. Um, <laughs> For the last five years doing their development, director of planning and development, building the uh, physical properties. So now being back at Homeward has just been full circle and it's a small community I think amongst all of us in terms of social services. I'm sure uh, there are many people in here who might work for one organization or the other. Um, so a summary of purpose and, and vision of the organization, Na Naomi Thornton spoke earlier about women's opportunity and resource development and in fact that's where Homeward um, was spawned. Uh, Back in 1994, Word recognized the need for, the basic need for more housing to be created. Um, it's a challenge to get out there and actually build the bricks and mortar. It's, a, it's an expensive endeavor. The federal government does not really want to get back in the business of providing the bricks and mortar um, part of creating housing for all of the folks that we serve um, in this community. So one of the initiatives that um, came from HUD, and it was to create community housing development organizations. And so as a project of words, uh, they started to develop uh, affordable housing for those most in need. Now, the majority of folks that we serve are uh, single moms, but that is not all we serve. And so for a long time, I think the organization might have had that identity, primarily because women's opportunity and resource development focuses on women's needs. 
1998, uh, Homeward became its own 501c3 organization, and the two organizations have worked very closely ever since. And um, so our mission, we actually just had a mission revision. It's the same work we do, but we just <coughs> edited the mission. Basically, it's easier to say. Uh, I don't know if you ever remember our mission. It was replicable methods and asset building strategies, and it's like, what does that mean? So, <laughs> um, really, what we do is, is we provide, um, we build housing, we build safe, healthy housing um, using sustainable methods. And that might mean using energy efficient methods, that's green building methods, it's also the approach that we take. So, we do design shreds where we, we bring community leaders and individuals and residents, uh, neighborhood members to the table and do three, you know, well, oftentimes three day long design <coughs> shreds. And we often come out at the end of that process with something we would have never imagined. Um, partly, what's signature about that is that um, I think when you're going along the fast track of development, that's sort of an oxymoron. But um, <laughs> uh, you, why open up? You know, kind of opening up the secret closet to development, or telling you know having other people tell you what they want to see. But the fun part is that we've really come up with some very unique and rewarding parts of, of our development, like rooftop gardens, for example, at the Gold Dust, which is down on, on North First Street, for example. And um, the other significant part of our organization is we provide programming. We do foreclosure prevention counseling. We teach home buyer education. And we also teach a financial fitness class. And if you read the paper on Wednesday, we actually had an op-ed, which I was delighted to see. Didn't even expect it in there. And uh, so that was really rewarding to see, partly because um, that leads right into one of the, the, the main challenges we have, which is actually funding those programs. Our, our main uh, partner in that, uh, we work with NeighborWorks Montana, which is uh, an affiliate of a national organization, and, and Jim and I both sit on the board of that state organization. Um, and it, that's a primary funding source for the home buyer education and finding, uh, foreclosure prevention and financial fitness. But, but much of those services, we have to go out and actually fundraise for. And the, the significance of, of those programs are quite huge. We've actually served over 4,500 people through our home buyer education program. We are going to be having a 10-year celebration in January, so we're delighted uh, about that. And the, 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 what we can deliver in terms of, of service is that we're a third-party um, organization in the sense that we don't have a bias. We're not trying to send you to a certain lender. We're not trying to sign you up with a certain program. One of the programs that we are able to facilitate through that is the Home Start program, which is through the Federal Home Loan Bank in Seattle. And it's a three to one matching program. Um, as you can imagine, as bank profits have uh, obviously you know, been seriously curtailed, and it's not just been over the last year. I mean, this has been cut back over the last several years. But I am proud to say that, that we've been able to serve uh, over 265 people, over $1.3 million in home start money we've been able to match. And mostly people use that for down payment and closing costs. Now over the years you can imagine down payments basically went off the window and they're using that for closing costs. Uh, a real partner in that of course is the Human Resource Council and their first time home buyer program. <coughs> and also the Housing Authority does a home ownership program. So you can imagine our low income to moderate income home buyers are using a whole menu of different resources to try to get into a home. And that leads me to, to, to really put a plug in for home buyer education. I mean, here we are in this economic crisis, and first time home buyers, low income, moderate income home buyers, in my opinion, are the scapegoat for what's happened in the economic circumstances. And there might be some, some folks that should not have taken out mortgages and not have taken out loans. But the reality is if somebody is educated in all of our programs, we know that the, the more somebody has an ed education, and um, knows what to look for, knows how to shop for predatory loans, those types of things, then they're much better off. Um, so some of the successes of the organization um, that we can celebrate, if you look at the you see many of our uh, properties that are um, innovative in the sense that we do green building and sustainable, sustainable building techniques. The newest property that's going up is on the corner of Russell and Broadway. Um, we deconstructed the Liberty Lane site. Uh, much of that, uh, uh, hardly any uh, materials went to the landfill. And uh, we're building 35 units of um, affordable housing there. Uh, very exciting. We actually just picked out the solar voltaic solar panels yesterday and um, doing a bunch of really wonderful river restoration work uh, along the river. We've 
got some incredible partners for that, the City of Missoula, Missoula Redevelopment Agency. The reason we're able to access some of those funds is because the second phase of that property will be a mixed use site. We ideally will build our new offices there and then um, some uh, additional commercial and hopefully affordable home ownership but also market rate as well. And um, our board just went through a strategic planning process, so we're looking you know, down the road in terms of how to make the organization more sustainable. Um, our, one, again, one of our, our bigger challenges, though, is being in this, uh, operating in this financial climate. Much of the funding that we use to build those properties are totally dependent on the credit market, the, <coughs> the, the industry. Basically, we sell long-term housing tax credits to those organizations and banks that need to defer their, their their tax uh, taxes because they've got income gain. Well, you can imagine there's not a whole lot of income gain out there right now. So it's our our largest problem is that for a long time we couldn't fund the projects, getting the land, the construction costs very very high. Now we can get the projects. We can't find the actual money to put it together because it's just um, unprecedented times. So I, I know I need to wrap up here. And what's on the horizon? Uh, the organization has been taking a look at a business plan to do co-development around the state. Uh, we also develop in Billings. We've got two properties there and a home ownership center as well. Um, one of the bigger challenges, of course, is operating a satellite office. And, um, but we have been invited by many communities to come help them co-develop. And what that means is either on a consulting basis, what it's, con what it's starting to look like more and more, though, is that we're the actual owners. Because as these small groups and communities want to get housing built, there is nobody to fund those organizations because as money retracts, they're not going to fund uh, sponsors that have the experience. So we're looking at how we could sustainably branch out into the state and effectively help communities build capacity for building housing, but also managing that housing long term. And um, we do quite a bit on the legislative level as well. So two pieces we'll be working on is getting the housing trust fund funded in the state and then also predatory lending. So. Um, if anybody wants to go to the legislature with me, give me a call. We'll right over there together. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm Lori Davidson, the interim director of the Missoula Housing Authority, um, also the planning development director now, and uh, the deputy director. So <laughs> three jobs. Um, but it has been um, it's it's been wonderful, really. We've uh, we've come a long way at the housing authority. Um, <coughs> We too have just uh, started our strategic planning process. Um, I apologize for being late today. One of the reasons I was late was we just started our strategic planning process. <laughs> and um, so I can actually speak a little bit to our purpose and vision, having been uh, um, renewed that yesterday with our board. Um, uh, we want to think of the Housing Authority with words like um, creative, innovative, uh, um, serving low and moderate income, and moderate income goes up to 120%, so that some of those higher income families can support our work for families at uh, the lower income groups. Um, we're developers, we're leaders in affordable housing. We are, um, I'm trying to think of a couple of other words. Uh, we promote self-sufficiency among our clients and economic independence. Um, so we see ourselves in a lot of different ways and partnership and collaboration is a big part of what we do. We have partnerships with many of you out here as well as referring people to your services. Um, we partner with Homeward in that we have a, con a management contract with them to manage our properties. We uh, partner with the Pavarello Center, who we contract to provide 24-hour supportive services at our Valor House uh, Housing for Homeless Vets and um, McClay Commons, the Joseph Residence at McClay Commons. We serve over 1,300 families with housing subsidies. 333 of them we own or have an ownership interest in and manage. Another 83 we contract to manage. We have a, a Shelter Plus Care program, which has 101 vouchers that are targeted towards homeless persons with disabilities, and uh, 754 Section 8 or Housing Choice vouchers. They're used interchangeably. Those, both of those programs, the tenants take a voucher out into the community and rent from a private landlord, and we subsidize the rent to the landlord. 
We have a very, very, very successful family self-sufficiency program, and Tamara Kindred is here with me today. She is one of our FSS directors. Uh, we've just been interviewed by a team of HUD contractors who are going around the country and assessing our FSS program, and they uh, were astonished at how well we do. Uh, last year, we gave out over $80,000 in interim disbursements. This was not our money. This is money that those folks have earned by increasing their earned income. And in return, HUD puts aside uh, an amount of money in escrow for them. And we allow them, which I found out from them is rather unusual, to take interim disbursements from that, from that fund to um, pay for classes or if they get a job and they need clothes, uh, car repairs is a very common one. I've, I've found out from them that a lot of programs around the country don't let people do that. Um, so I think it's a really essential part of helping our folks become self-sufficient, so um, I'm a real big supporter of that. So we're, we're uh, very much in partnership and collaboration. Uh, we also have a Section 8 home ownership program where people can take their voucher and use it for <coughs> home ownership. We, uh, a lot of our clients use programs that HRDC sponsors and Home Start, and um, they all must take advantage of the uh, home ownership counseling classes that Homeward offers. So that is a, that is a very big piece of making our programs successful. So um, we are very supportive of their efforts to gain funding and keep that um, keep that program going because they're the only ones in town that offer it, and they um, also offer financial fitness classes that a lot of our clients. Are referred to. Uh, as developers, we have done a lot in the past few years. Um, to we have uh, targeted three of our programs towards homeless persons. We built the uh, we purchased and rehabbed the Uptown Motel downtown, which is housing for homeless individuals. Uh, Seventeen units of housing for homeless veterans, which is um, actually <coughs> becoming quite. Um, well-known nationwide. I was just in Virginia last week. They invited and paid for me to come out there and give them a presentation on how we put Valor House together because they're trying to do something similar out there. Um, McClay Commons is 16 units of housing for homeless families. Uh, we've also purchased the Palace in the last couple of years, 60 units of housing downtown. Um, what am I forgetting? Glengarra. Yep, Glengarra. We uh, partnered with Missoula Housing Corporation as the sponsor, built uh, 41 units of housing at Glengarra Place, which is <coughs> Section 202 from HUD, which is a special funding stream <coughs> for elderly housing. Um, we don't own or manage that property, but we were the project manager and developer for it. Um, and we also, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> she uh, helped us. Uh, to build not actually nine units of replacement public housing. One of our efforts right now is um, something that we did a few years ago. We sold 45 units of large, inefficient, single-family homes that were part of our actual public housing program. And by that I mean housing that is a separate funding pot from HUD that goes to um, operate those units. We own them with a HUD deed of trust and they give us an operating subsidy for them. And when those units become uh, inefficient to run and we don't have money to renovate them, one of the things HUD allows us to do is to sell them and reuse that money to build similar housing. So in 2002, we did that with 45 units. We're now looking, we have an application in to sell 20 more of them. And the funds that we got from that disposition was uh, the money that we used to leverage a lot of the projects we've been able to do. Um, we also own the 12-acre uh, site at Intermountain Lumber, which through one of our subsidiary corporations called Intermountain Development Company. We are actively working on a 37-unit low-income housing tax credit project there, which we expect to start construction in January. <coughs> um, let's see, so that's some of our successes. Um, and that's also what's coming up. Uh, <coughs> The disposition of the public housing units will give us another development pool, which we will look to leverage against other resources to provide some housing. But we're also looking at replacing some public housing. And 
uh, that kind of segues into what we see on the legislative level. Um, public housing is starting to see some more support at the congressional level. Obama has uh, made a commitment to fund <coughs> public housing as uh, at the 100% level, which is something we haven't seen in 10 years. Uh, last year's public housing funding was at 82% of our calculated need. HUD has an operating subsidy calculation that they use to figure out how much you should need to effectively run your public housing, and then Congress gives you like 80% of that. So um, last year it was supposed to be 82%, but we've just heard recently they're raising it to 89%, and we're looking in 2009 at having it be at 88%, which is a great improvement over what it's been in the past. We also have some new tools at the national level that will help affordable housing, the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, coming through the CDBG program, um, is for houses that are in foreclosure to uh, purchase those properties and rehab them. It has several, uh, several different uses. One of the things it can also do is buy vacant property and help, help you develop it. And we have the National Housing Trust Fund, which will give um, money in about two years, make money available to the states for affordable housing development and operation. Uh, the first two years of that money, it's funded through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the first two years of that program goes to the Hope for Home, Home Ownership Program, which is to help people who are in danger of foreclosure to refinance their homes. After that two years, those monies are dispersed around the states. We'll get about three million, which is because of our small population, we always get the minimum allocation from the federal government on things like that. We'll get uh, about three million. 80% of that allocation must go for rentals, and 25% of that 80% must be for renters at 30% of median income or below. So we are finally seeing at the national level some assistance for the affordable housing rental market. And a lot of focus has been made on home ownership, and that's a great thing, but home ownership is not for everybody, and will never serve 100% of our population. So we really are trying to keep in people's minds the need for rental housing and affordable rental housing in particular is equally as important as home ownership. It's really all about housing choice, what kinds of housing choices people make at the, as their different stages in their life and making sure that they have those choices. Thank you. <coughs> Again, I'm Lynn Stocking from the UM College of Technology. We are, as part of the University of Montana, the two-year education arm, and also part of the state of Montana two-year education group. Um, we offer short and long-term programs um, short, if we're talking about credit programs, are one-year Certificate of Applied Sciences, Applied Science programs, and then Associate of Applied Science degree programs as well, and those are two-year. We're also the college that offers the Associate of Arts, which is a transfer program, and will transfer actually to the Greater U of M to baccalaureate programs, but also to other places in the state of Montana and and elsewhere. I won't promise <laughs> exactly <laughs> where, but certainly that the opportunity is available. We have been involved in contract training and workforce training. Of course, uh, we do that um, with special projects and certainly in partnership with folks that are sitting around the table here. Our um, challenges, I guess, are certainly similar to many of yours, and that has to do with our funding model. Um, and it doesn't relate to our enrollment, which is, um, I think, something that we are proud of and certainly we support, and we see that there will be an increase in that particular enrollment. But right now, at least for this particular university, this is not the case in the state of Montana as a rule, 
but for this particular university we are part of the whole and our enrollment does not necessarily, at least at this point in time, <coughs> impact our funding. We need to speak to someone about that, however, um, that, that becomes a challenge for us. We operate um, a number of our special programs and initiatives with grant funding and certainly we are and we are willing to and have been in the past partners for a variety of other funding um, that support folks in programs and hopefully toward their success of finishing that means retention in the program as well as employment and retention in employment so we look beyond our walls as far as programs and success go. Successes, I guess, we might identify certainly our enrollment, our opportunity to do outreach and partner. Um, we have and are identified at this university, University of Montana, um, one of the largest enrollment or offerings in online courses um, and that particular effort is evolving in terms of advising and support but the College of Technology has stepped out for a number of years to develop and offer distance education via the online uh, model. And we believe that we're offering some opportunities to folks who would not otherwise have those. Some of our projects that are other than just general courses, um, and you could certainly look at UM online at the University of Montana and see a list of those courses, but some of our projects, um, the one that we kind of hang our hat on is a surgical technology program that uses both um, on-site and distance or online education, and we have done that for a number of years where um, we have a Missoula program, a Butte program, and a Billings program, and at some point we hope we have the opportunity to grow, but it's a model that we continue to use as we work within the state. So we could identify that, I guess, as a, certainly as a su success. Um, we value our partners in this community and across the state, and so I personally would identify those partnerships that we have in this community and that we support and extend as successes because I think it makes us all successful. Um, and we could name any number of things that are going on with those of you that are here in the room and others. And I think that's critical to anybody's success and certainly to ours. And we recognize that as, as a value. Some new projects that we're doing now and are on the horizon. And there is a long list of those, but let me give you a few. Um, one at least that we will be developing and hopefully, hopefully talking more with you about is, and it's actually funded um, through a grant at this point, uh, is to explore and, and even go beyond that for identifying and supporting folks in careers that are not stereotypical of their gender, which means males in, let's say nursing, <coughs> that's one example, or females in the industrial technology areas or still yet in the computer technology area. And so we um, are directed really by some other grant funding to take that on, but Luckily, I think that in that direction, we're recognizing some opportunities in this community and others to focus on that. Thank you. Um, we have an intro to engineering program that's on our horizon next fall, although we're offering courses now. Um, we are calling it computer-aided design, but it's just the beginnings in the drafting program because we've had a call from our community for that. And <coughs> organizations that say they need those people in those uh, type of positions. Um, we have energy technology, an all online program at this point, which we'll see um, develop into um, online 
and on site as we're doing some practicum um, situations and learning that that's what we need to make that program successful and the people in it successful. On the horizon, pharmacy technician program or technology program as we call it, we are developing and you'll hear more about that in the next year, an online program to rural places in Montana. We've kind of been picking at that, we're going after it this particular year. Other rural initiatives for the College of Technology will involve nursing. And so follow along a similar model as the Search Tech. We have a community partner that actually is a community partner from Montana and has um, properties in California, Arizona, and Florida. So we have an opportunity to take our program out that wide. So um, I think that's interesting in terms of the kind of partnerships that we can all develop. Dual credit and <coughs> concurrent enrollment are partnerships with the high schools in Missoula, and that's where we're starting, and in the Bitterroot Valley. So we have an opportunity to work through the systems in that way, and that should be mentioned. Um, another one, so before I finish that I mentioned, uh, the Missoula Building Industry Association. We have just recently signed a memo of understanding with that group to actually create a home on site with our construction program, or we call it the carpentry program, and this association, flagship in Missoula, and as well, although we haven't put the final touches on this, um, high school construction programs in Missoula as well. Huge uh, opportunity uh, and pretty exciting, so I guess there's a success that we can identify. One last piece, I'll talk about affordable housing. Um, part of uh, the day of signing was to go out and see the modular home that the carpentry program has already built and I'm here to tell you that we have some affordable housing mm -hmm. still <laughs> available. <laughs> if someone has a place to put it, we have a house to put it on. <laughs> so, or on it, rather, let me say it that way. Anyway, there's certainly a number of other programs and initiatives at the College of Technology and the University of Montana. I speak better about those at the College of Technology, but no, that university-wide, there's some other things that we can um, work with and identify. So, thank you. So, Michelle, since I brought two of my staff members, does no. that mean I get thirty minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and this means peace, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I'm Monique. I'm the director of the Adult Education Division, and my goal in the next five to ten minutes is to tell you what we do without using any acronyms. So, you know, if you guys want to keep a tally, if I use one, let me know. I'll pay you a buck for each one. Um, let me tell you how we fit in. We are part of Missoula County Public Schools, and we are the Adult Education Division. What that means is that we serve individuals who are 16 years of age and older in our community. Our primary goal is to be able to serve them in educational areas without regard to their economic status. So our goal is to provide our classes and programs either free of charge through grant funding sources or as low cost as possible. Uh, we try to break even at the end of the year. We're not in the business to make money, but you know we're not in the business to lose money either. Let me tell you a little bit about some of our primary programs. First of all, in your packets, you have hot off the press, which the ink may still be drying, our new quarterly schedule. So if you have not seen our quarterly schedules before, you are the first group to get them. They are sacred at this point. <coughs> we have people calling our office asking for them. You have to keep them sacred. <laughs> uh, if you find a class that you'd like to register for, please don't call us until December 1st because my staff's going to go, who gave out the schedule? <laughs> So that'll give you an idea after you leave here, um, kind of fill in some of the details that I don't. So we have a parent education program. The primary goal of that education program is to bring 
uh, skills and uh, services in an educational fashion to parents in our community out to the local schools. And we try to do that either free of charge or at no charge at all. Anyone who cannot afford our parent education classes, we provide a waiver to waive that fee for them. We also have an adult basic education program. The primary goal of that program is to assist individuals improve their basic skills, be it in math, reading, writing, um, to be able to obtain their GED, which is the General Educational Development uh, Certification. I almost blew it, didn't I? <laughs> um, or if they have 50 cents. Yeah, there we go. Or if they would like to gain or retain employment, or if they are looking at going on to post-secondary education, we have transitional classes in place to help them succeed either at the College of Technology or at a four-year program or any other uh, short-term or other vocational training program. We also have an Even Start program that is a family literacy based program. It contains four components. Our adults have to be participating in an adult literacy portion. Our children have an early childhood education program that they may attend. The family has to participate in a parent education program as well as we combine it all together in what we call as parent and child time together, otherwise known as PAC. And that's when the parents get to come together and practice their skills at being the first teacher of their children and practice their parenting skills. We do have, we are the state or the, the testing center for the GED and we provide GED testing approximately 20 to 22 times per year. We have an, a, a continuing education program, and within that continuing education program, when you look through the schedule, that is primarily our fee-based classes. We do classes to improve uh, workforce training. We have a number of short-term training programs in the medical field, as well as a few others. You'll also see that we provide computer classes. We have the largest number of dance and fitness classes of any organization in Missoula. We provide contract training classes, so if businesses and organizations are needing additional training for their staff, we can customize it and bring it out to them. Let me tell you a little bit about our challenges. We provide classes in 18 different locations spread out from Seeley Lake into Missoula, and it's a challenge trying to manage all of those sites. To be lively in adult education, you have to be in a constant state of change. That is a challenge because you have to continue to try to meet the ever-changing demands of the students and based on the economics as well as the workforce demands in our community. Those are not bad challenges for us. The primary challenge for us is obviously being able to continue to grow the way we've grown lately with the same amount of resources. We have operated with the same amount of resources for approximately seven years, and you all know what that does to your budgets. So we are spaced out, meaning we um, cannot grow much further without needing additional space, and we are in a constant state of change, and those aren't bad things. Our successes is what, are what we really like to talk about. We are the largest adult education program in the state of Montana in that we served 11,000, over 11,500 registrants last year in all of our programs. Um, we are a shining star because in Missoula we have great partners that we collaborate with and that collaborate with us and that is definitely a testament to this community. We continue to grow. Uh, we have over 150 instructors that we employ, and we are always looking for more instructors. Most of them are on a part-time basis. We have 6.5 office staff or personnel that put it all, puts it all together each quarter, and that number of uh, office staff and personnel has stayed constant for the last 10 years. 
So we are an ever-changing program that continues to expand our services. We have uh, new classes in, in the Sealy Lake community, so we hope to continue that partnership. We also have a partnership with Hellgate School District to provide a number of classes in their facilities, and they support that. Uh, we just received notification yesterday that a, an application for us to be able to provide distance learning, peace to you too, no. <laughs> distance learning through our adult basic education program has been accepted at the state level. We are very excited about that because what that does is that allows us to serve our students that are most in need and have issues with anything from transportation to work schedules to be able to assist them in improving their basic skills through a distance learning module and we will be developing that a little bit more in the next couple of months and hope to roll that out mid to end of January right Renee so that's exciting for us um, I have a request for anyone, if you are writing grants and you are looking to put an educational component in it, we like to partner with you on that and like to assist in any of those efforts that you may have coming down the road. And we like to take our show on the road. So if you have a staff meeting coming up and you would like to have us come present as to what we may be able to offer your clients and or your staff, give us a call. We would be more than happy to do that. I have 30 seconds left. What did I miss? We also do serve the English <coughs> as a second language population in our adult basic education program. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Um, I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a great place. And thank you all for doing what you do. I'm Janet Van Dyke. I'm the Regional Administrator of the Missoula Region for Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, like many of you, our region covers the seven, seven western counties of Montana. <coughs> Voc Rehab is a federal state match program. We get 20% of our money from the state and 80, about 80% from the federal government. Um, our mission is to promote work and independence for Montanans with disabilities. So our whole focus is on employment. Um, so we don't pay the rent, we don't pay utilities, we don't buy food, so that's why we need all of you. Um, everything that we um, assist our clients with is related to helping them <coughs> obtain and keep employment. Um, so to that end, we might get involved with academic supporting them in academic training um, on job training job coaching job development supported employment assistive technology so those are the kinds of services that we provide we provide it to people who have disabilities and those disabilities have to be significant impediments to employment and they have to be permanent so someone with a broken leg who can't drive <coughs> his truck for six months likely would not qualify, um, but someone who broke their leg and got an infection in it and um, may be on crutches who happens to be a truck operator could qualify. So we do have some eligibility criteria. <coughs> some of our challenges, it's interesting, I've heard a couple of people talk about how some challenges have actually um, prompted a renewed effort, um, I think, what the, the city did with the panhandle of downtown is an example. Ours aren't quite as um, interesting as that, but this year, the Missoula region was honored to be selected the community that the federal reviewers would come to to do their annual review of, of the non-site um, of the work that we do. The state auditors also selected Missoula office to be where they were going to do their state audit. <laughs> and then we had a delegation of Japanese rehab people to come in. Um, and they needed English as a second language. Um, and I'm happy to say that we got through all of those with um, good reports from all of them. Um, also this past year, well, for the past several years, we've 
achieved our, our goal, and achieving our goal means that how many people we successfully um, assisted towards employment. And that's important because how many people you get employed plus how many people you serve is what determines how much money we get. And because Western Montana is the area of Montana that's growing the largest, we have the largest caseload in the state. So it's important that we do keep up those 26s. Um, a couple of challenges. Um, we have a program called Supported Employment, and that's a program for individuals who have such significant impediments to employment that they wouldn't be able to maintain their job once folk rehab is a short-term program, so we, we don't last forever once somebody's employed. Um, we keep them on the job for 90 days, and then we're done. For some individuals, if we stop their job coaching services, for various reasons, they may or may not be able to keep their jobs, so we have the supported employment program. Um, what pays for that supported employment program after voc rehab ends is called long-term sign-off, it could be the developmental disabilities program that Jack mentioned, could be mental health, or it could be a program called extended employment, which is totally funded by the state. In our office, um, if someone was, we have a waiting list, there's not enough money. All, many of you have waiting lists. Right now, if someone was put on that waiting list in Missoula, it could be a 10 to 12 year wait before they could get into services. So that's one of our challenges. Um, Two years ago, we did receive a big block of money for that program and we were able to reduce our waiting list from like a 15 year wait to a 10 year wait. <laughs> Another challenge that we have facing us because we, because services, education is more expensive for us, we're getting more clients, um, you know, things are just costing more, but we're not getting more money. There's a nationwide, if a voc rehab program cannot serve all people, you go into something called order of selection. And that means that you designate each person as having a certain level of disability. And in our state, it would be a four level disability. Um, and if we go into order of selection, it means that people who are not as significantly disabled may not get services. And we've been able to not go into order of selection. Most of the states in the country are on order of selection now. Um, in the next year or so, it's very likely that we will go into order of selection. And that's sad because a lot of the people you work with may not have significant severe disabilities, but they may have something that's going to be interfering with their ability to get and keep a job. And if we're in order of selection, we wouldn't be able to serve them. Um, so, peace to you too. <laughs> <laughs> and I can introduce Dell. Dell works in blind low vision, which is another arm of folk rehab. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Dell Addis. I'm the program manager for blind and low vision services. We are linked but distinct, I always say, from Janet's program. We're co-located in the same building, share the same space, but we are different in a variety of ways. However, I'll talk about first about the vocational rehabilitation program, and that is where we are linked in that uh, our job also is to, to help blind individuals get jobs, but we work exclusively uh, with that population. We are eligibility-based like her program. In order to be eligible, you have to have a visual impairment, needs to be a significant impediment to work, and our services need to be required for you to obtain or maintain work. And we provide a long list of the same services, job search assistance, retraining, assistive technology, things of that nature. What makes us a little bit different is because of the sensory nature of the disability, we have a team of two instructional staff. We have an orientation mobility specialist who teaches people to use the white cane as a tool to get around safely and effectively. We have a rehabilitation teacher who teaches activities of daily living in the home, cooking, cleaning, money management, addresses, things of that nature. And they both collaborate on low vision evaluation, education, and prescription. And we have a low vision lab in our office where we can provide that help to people. 
So um, I'm, I feel very fortunate. I've been with the program a long time. Right now I have a very good, dedicated, self-motivated team. Those of you that have been doing your work for a long time know how wonderful that is when you have staff come and go. We have two other programs that make us a little different from the general program. We have an older blind program. Uh, Judah's familiar with that. She allows us to use some of her space for support groups for the old and blind. That is strictly independent living. That is not work. And that is managed pretty autonomously by Mark O'Brien and Diane Gray, my instructional staff. Uh, we have a support group every, every month. Um, and they limit it pretty much to the orientation and mobility I spoke about, the independent living, and the low vision. It's a huge program. Uh, the four of us uh, in my administrative aid, we cover all seven counties. And as you might imagine, with the growth in Western Montana and the retirement mecca it is becoming, we have a lot of growth in that older blind program. And our third program is our visual services medical. It's our medically needy program. That is not work. That is not independent living. That is strictly uh, a medically needy program for individuals who have uh, an eye condition that can lead to blindness or severe low vision and they have no resources to pay for needed medical care. As you might guess, there is incredible stress on that program. You know, I have some very tough decisions to make with the people that present to me needing, needing that help. Um, in terms of challenges, um, I would say uh, one, problem, one challenge we have, although some of these challenges are somewhat successes as well, so I'm happy to report, but one of the services we provide under the <coughs> program is assistive technology. For blind people, that's typically uh, screen reading software for computers or magnification software for computers. And um, that's pretty sophisticated stuff, especially the, the speech reading software. And it's hard to get that service to people. Uh, the, the learning speed, the ramp up on a speech software program is pretty steep. Um, and that's a challenge when a, in a state of 147,000 square miles pretty low uh, population of blind people. It, so it's a, it's a low incidence disability, but it's very expensive to rehabilitate. But along that line, you know, we actually were able to, in planning, get an assistive technology specialist funded by the legislature, uh, I think it was two or four years ago. So we do have that guy headquartered in Helena, but we are still experimenting with service delivery because he can't go on the road state this big, we'd burn him out in a year and he'd be gone. So uh, we're experimenting with some quarterly trainings where maybe we can send some people to Helena every quarter. Trying to get some money, I've encouraged him to write up a proposal. Every once in a while money does drop on us out of the sky and we need to spend it yesterday. And I would like for him to have a proposal ready to go to develop a lab. So it is a challenge to uh, to meet that technology need, but we are, we are working on it. Additionally, like Many of the rest of you were dealing with static budgets in a time of growing need. But there again, you know, we've tried to turn that into a success. And our older blind program especially, I think someone over here mentioned that they qualified for the lowest grant because of the population of the state. We, as, we did that as well. Our older blind grant is only a quarter of a million dollars. And my administrative assistant, um, Jeannie Stone, crackerjack lady, I'm lucky to have her, and uh, she was noticing, you know, we're, we were ordering a lot of individual equipment for these older blind people, and the shipping and handling just kills you. We order a lot of equipment in our program because of the sensory nature of the disability. She took it upon herself to do a study of what we were spending for equipment and what we were spending for shipping and handling, and we've begun to experiment in the last year with a bulk buying process whereby we got all our staff together, did a kind of a census on the most frequently ordered items, began to order them in bulk to distribute them, and last year we saved $2,000 in shipping and handling costs. So I felt that was a, that was a nice uh, celebration to, uh, success to celebrate. Um, so on the horizon, you know, I, I really don't know what's on the horizon. Uh, I'm just hoping we can keep it together um, as, as, we, as we are now. We are again part of this uh, order selection process that that um, Janet talked about. You know, and that can be good and that can be bad. I mean, we have for totally functionally blind people, it, talks, it takes a lot of money to rehabilitate them. And of course, 
the whole point of order of, success, of order of selection is to ensure that the most people with the most severe disabilities get the services, and no one can argue with that. Uh, we we often have to consider our standard indicators, as she said, about the successful closures, and of course that's going to impact that. And we would take a big hit on successful closures in that one year, most likely, if we go to order. But these are just challenges. I mean, every day you got to just deal with stuff. So you just do that. Um, I hear me. I'm well under my 10 minutes. Right? <coughs> yeah, two. Uh, I don't. I don't want to get. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing like being last on <laughs> Friday afternoon. All right. Since I'm sitting next to Michelle, I'm sure I'll stay with the mic. <laughs> I'm Chris Holmes. I'm the associate director of the YWCA Missoula, and the YWCA is. Um, Nonprofit, and I think maybe older. We were established in 1911, so I might have you over there. Um, uh, the YWCA is a, is a huge pro or a huge agency with many, many programs. But I think, for the interest of time, I will just talk about our direct service programs, which are our Pathways program, our Aidas Place Transitional Housing program, and Planet Kids, our Supervised Visitation Safe Exchange program. Pathways, as probably most of you know, is our domestic violence sexual assault service program. We have 24-hour crisis line and advocacy, and also um, a shelter for women and children with safety needs. Uh, we also work with St. Pat's First Step to provide sexual assault services for survivors. Um, our Ada's Place Transitional Housing Program, we have 18 units of housing that homeless women and their children can reside in for up to 18 months. And with that, uh, Beyond Housing, it is a program that includes case management and life skills. Planet Kids is our supervised visitation safe exchange program, and we provide those services for families who are divorcing or separating, and there has been violence in the home or substance abuse or mental health issues, something that requires that there's a third party to help with either the exchange of the children or actually to supervise the visits. So those are our three main programs. Um, some exciting things that we're, we're working on in kind of a preventative way are our Women's Leadership Program, which is an eight-week um, leadership series for women in the community. We also just added the GUTS program, which is our girls utilizing their strength program. It's a leadership program for girls 9 to 17. They do community adventures and community activities. In the wintertime and in the summertime, we actually do um, summer camping and summer outdoor adventures with those gals. We have just um, excuse me, <coughs> started um, to look at our Women's Economic Advancement Program and we're working um, with the work program to develop a training tool for employers to help uh, recognize the barriers of the working poor and how employers can work uh, better with um, their low-income employees around transportation issues, child care issues. Um, other things that come up for the working poor. And um, we have our racial justice program, which is a, a social marketing campaign. Challenges, I feel a little redundant uh, saying this, but um, like all of you, financial uh, challenges. We had a huge loss. In our Pathways program, we lost a $54,000 federal grant that funded staff in our Pathways program. We, we have also seen cuts uh, with two of our major uh, long-term state grants as well. Um, and with cuts means um, staffing uh, loss. And uh, we're happy and proud to say that our Secret Second stores um, helped cover 33% of our overall budget uh, last year. So that has helped us <coughs> the reality is uh, less money and a huge increase in service needs. Our shelter has been packed into capacity since summertime and what that means for us is when we are full people still have safety needs so we're having to put them in hotels at a huge cost to us to keep them safe. Uh, not only does it cost money but then they don't receive the same hands-on staff support that they would if they were in our shelter. 
other challenges are with our supervised visitation center, there is just a bigger need than what we can afford to offer services. Really, we could do visits or exchanges seven days a week, and right now uh, we have the resources to provide that for five days a week. Our transitional housing program, um, we have an all-time high number of women waiting on that list. Generally, we have between eight to 10 women and their children waiting. We currently, I just checked this morning, we have 19 women and their children waiting on that list. So as the economy is affecting all of us, it's really impacting those that, that we're working with. Some successes, uh, the last year we received a large federal grant to increase our transitional housing uh, units. We were able to add two units for single women and also some units um, in Roman for Native American families. So that, that's a big success. Around Planet Kids, I just met with law enforcement and they have reported a sharp decrease in the number of domestic violence responses that they're having to go out on when parents are exchanging their children. Huge, it makes us feel really good about what we're providing for survivors and their kids. And then I mentioned uh, the success of our secret second stores, which we just opened a new one by the university. If you want to shop there. Um, yeah, 33% of our overall budget came from revenues with those three stores, so we're very proud of those. On the horizon, um, our space issues, I heard that a lot today too. Um, our shelter is to capacity, our transitional housing units are to capacity, and our office, office space is to capacity. So we are looking um, at a long range plan of consolidating <coughs> all those off-site places into one location. We recognize what a huge project that is, and with the current economic and uh, we will be moving forward with that very, very slowly and very thoughtfully. We are also working on a revolving loan fund for uh, women staying in our shelter and our transition housing programs so that we can help them with deposits and rental needs to help them get, the, help get them out on their own sooner. We find that is a huge need. Oftentimes women in our shelter, all they need is money for deposits <coughs> to, to move on into their own space. So hopefully by January we'll be able to offer that. And finally, we will be going uh, back to the legislature this year to try to develop a state funding source for supervised visitation and safe exchange services. Happy to say that we have been, Planet Kids has been refunded for five years, but then will not be eligible for funding on that. So we will look not only for Missoula County, but Wolf, you want to jump in? I'm not going to stand up. Probably missed the first part of you, um, your speech. I mean, a couple of things that we're after, and we're not going to put anybody on the spot today. The, the question that we're going to send around is, is this a useful format for people? And would we recognize, you know, just looking at the quality of leadership in this room, taking a half a day out of your days is huge, and we appreciate that tremendously. It was it was a great opportunity, I think, at least for me personally, to hear what all is going around. And I think Ginny probably uh, learned a few things here and there too to pass on to the city. Uh, so, so we're going to be asking a couple of questions via survey. Was this useful? Should we do this again? How often should we do it, if if at all? And is the format okay? Uh, we're we're really looking for candid feedback on that. If you think this was eh, not very productive, let us know and we'll try for something different. If it is productive, the more feedback we can get into the format, the better and the more meaningful we can make it. What, what I personally am also after is to give a similar opportunity to our staffs. I can't tell you how often we get people through the door that take in part of our service, but there's more. And it is so helpful for my staff to say, you know, in your particular case, it may be productive to go to Jim Morton and ask for energy assistance and Section 8 housing vouchers have that long of a waiting list, get on the list, here's the contact, here's the person. We've done a couple of cross-training academies for staff over the last few years, but it's been a while. And uh, a lot of times we tend to get management into a room and we get the big picture of what's going on but the groundwork is being done by staff on a daily basis when people come through our door. And we all have a little bit of tunnel vision, we know our agency very well, and 
we know maybe one or two. What we don't know is what our peers as case managers have available in terms of services. And I personally think it would be productive if we can get several of those smaller groups together and, and conduct training for people uh, at the staff level. Again, that is something that we'll put out via survey and uh, just get you feedback on what you think about that. Prior to doing that, uh, we have about 10 more minutes for an open forum for questions, any kind of input, feedback. If anybody would like to ask questions of other organizations that you had burning questions when they were presenting, now would be a great time to ask those questions. Or if you have feedback, on, like what Wolf said, on what you experienced here today, let's chat about it. Or if you just want to get out the door and hit to the <laughs> Grizz tailgate party that's starting in 20 minutes, Jack, you can go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sure the press box is open. No. There you go. Anyone? Well, I have a question for Jim. This 211 database, how do you access that? What do you call it? Yeah, it's a telephone information referral. You just click on the phone and dial 211. That's all you got? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's also on the web. Okay. Mike, Mike, right? Yeah. Your services, are they age dependent? Is there an age eligibility? <coughs> yeah, typically, we're working with persons between 18 and 65. And there is, depending on funding source, depending on the rules of the game, there is some wiggle room. And there is more and more a focus on kids, adolescents, high school age, to, especially those with disabilities, obviously, to get to them and evaluate and assess them while they're still young and malleable so they can be, you know, streamlined, transition. And there are programs within the high schools and <clears throat> in a rare occasions, junior high schools, to transition these kids and get them ready, at least thinking about work. So that's something that's probably not as developed as it could be, but it always follows the dollar. Kevin. Um, I heard you say something about uh, legislation on predatory lending. Do you have a bill sponsor for that? Uh, not as of yet, but we're working on that through Montana Women Vote. Okay, well, I, and I'm part of Montana Women Vote, I doubt that there is an agency in this room that does not have customers that are the victims of predatory lenders. Yeah. And I would very much like to work on that legislation. Okay, excellent. Yeah. I'd like to put those people out of business. Me too. <laughs> You know, and then they can come to our programs. That or at least cap their interest rates. How about yeah, that? They can still be in business, but they don't get to charge 600% of interest. Did you talk about the meeting on December 3rd? In Helena, I specifically asked about this issue about the Women's Foundation. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Is um, bringing people together in Helena. Um, I can send out information about the great. And anybody that wants to go is more than welcome. Um, from 10.30 to 3.30. So, yeah. Cool. No, I can't even know what that. 10.30 to 3.30 and where's that? And Helena at the Discovery Center. And I think you have to RSVP so that you know how many people are coming. But I'll just send them out. Is there other people that want to? Yeah, I, I see a classic application of this roundtable already, just with something as simple as a listserv for, you know, here's an event, or Mikey's working on one of his famous brands. And <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll get something out um, that people can then use to send information out. Sandra is the king of that. The queen no, I of that. Always the I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no,
the rest of us will volunteer Sonder for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, Michelle trying to interrupt Kelly. Right. Uh, she was in a tough spot. There. <laughs> Thanks for stepping in. We'll get my job. Anybody else? Well, you know, the, the only thing I'd say, again, thank you for the time that you all spent here. I think we, we have a good, solid core group together. There, there are some gaps. Uh, mental health was, was mentioned. Uh, the mental health system probably needs to be at the table. And it's a key partner in there. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful I have somebody from the city. We should probably institutionalize that and have somebody here. Not always you, Jenny, but somebody from city council possibly might be very useful. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a good beginning for a network that supports uh, each other's um, initiatives, grants, meetings. Um, it probably makes sense at some point down the road to take a more active and structured look at how do we make the voice of the human services community better heard in legislative issues. That takes some time, that takes some preparation. It's a little late for this time. But again, I think this group can serve as that vehicle for our community. Similar to what the chambers are doing from the business perspective, they are forming networks within each community of business people that then try to educate and hopefully influence their legislative delegations, at least from that community. I think that's the least we can do. And what strikes me is, is how interrelated we are. I mean, we, we, there's so many of us that deal with the same, same folks, um, maybe a little bit different, and they're in a little bit different areas of their life, but we are so interconnected. And if we could develop these relationships more, um, because it truly is, it's about, it's about the folks we serve. And if we can develop these relationships more so we have better knowledge, we have better support, we have legislative power, we have city power, whatever we happen to have that is going to help our folks, that's what we need to do. And we, you know, I, I don't know how the funding picture is going to be in the next 10 years. Sure hasn't been good in the last 10 years. And I, you know, I don't anticipate, unless we're part of that $70 billion bailout, that we're going to get much. So um, if power is in numbers, and if we as, as a group, as a community group, can be heard, that's what we need to do. Well, I would also like to suggest the, the aging committee. I'm not hearing, I, I got here a little late, but I think aging would be another group. You're right, you're yes, absolutely right. right. Ginny, anything from your end? Also, um, just on the county and office of planning and grants, you know, facilitates rights grants, facilitates funding to a number of these entities. Yeah. You know, has there any grant for funding opportunities on this catalyst? Um, a lot of this, a lot of <coughs> great, great. I was great. thinking in terms of um, what Kelly just said. And I don't want to beat this horse because it's my horse, but uh, private foundations funding um, may be one of our better bets short term. And if there's somewhere we have a common issue or a common focus, our collective shoulders pushing, as Kelly said, is going to have a lot more impact. And sometimes what happens, we tend to establish our own turf. And I'm guilty of that too. It's like you think about what's important to you and forgetting about how we're related. And typically the larger grants, the larger um, amounts of money go to people who make the most noise or have the biggest amount of push behind sometimes a pretty ponderous wheel. And I guess the key element of that is, um, and um, Jude mentioned about the legislative um, gathering that She's trying to pull together in early December, but to get legislative um, muscle behind it too. But it means we're going to have to all kind of, at least initially, focus on one issue that's common to all of us and grow from there. And it means giving up some autonomy, but I think that the issue here obviously is, is people and people that are at the bottom. And, and without our assistance, they're not going to be in an environment where they're ever going to be heard. I think you all can expect an email questionnaire type, just the 
two, the two parts that Wolf were talking about, um, what you found valuable of this, this meeting, how often you'd like to meet, and the other piece of the line staff issue, um, that would not be successful without your support and your willingness <coughs> to send your staff. So think about those things, and probably within a week or two, we'll, uh, we'll get that email out to everybody. Please respond. Your, your feedback is, is very important to the success of whether we do this again or not. So, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.